Hello, everybody. It's uh, me again. Um, I was asked to uh, continue the radicals section, so here I am. Uh, I, like I said, I taught this class before, and so uh, I know the uh, themes and the, the texts pretty well. And so let's talk about what radical politics means, uh, transitioning from the general idea of radical politics as it emerged in American university campuses in the early 1960s, and how it applies more specifically to race and gender. So let's turn to that today. Uh, talk about race first. This photograph, by the way, you've probably seen it before. This is Gloria Steinem and Angela Davis uh, from the later 1960s, two iconic uh, feminists of the, the radical movement. They're, they're still around. <laughs> they uh, still are very prominent in uh, the feminist movement and uh, you, you find their uh, articles and work all over the place. What does radicalism mean specifically for race? It uh, obviously translates quite directly into the concept of black power. That phrase is actually very old in American politics. If you go back to the years just before the Civil War, Frederick Douglass referred to it, um, only he meant it in a very different sense uh, from what it comes to mean in the 1960s. But here he says, the days of black power are numbered. Its course indeed is onward, but with the swiftness of an arrow, it rushes to its tomb. Of course, by that he means an end to slave power, which was the uh, more common word for it. The three-fifths clause, the compromise in the Constitution that allowed for uh, slaves to count for three-fifths of a person, person for the sake of uh, representation in the House of Representatives. Over the course of the 19th century, though, and especially by the 1850s, it was used for all kinds of things for uh, white Southern slave interests to advance their power over federal legislation. And then, of course, uh, when westward expansion happened and the question of whether or not states would enter as slave or free, they used it there, too. Uh, the three-fifths clause gave them greater leverage in the decision of state assemblies. So that's what it originally meant. It was a bad thing. You know, it was a, it was used uh, as a tool for advancing uh, the, the slave interests of the time. The phrase kind of drops out of use. It reappears, though, in the 1960s with, of course, Stokely Carmichael. Who was Stokely Carmichael? Uh, he came from Trinidad, uh, down in the Caribbean. He uh, graduated from Howard University and got directly involved in the early 1960s with the civil rights movement, the Freedom Riders in particular, the civil rights activists who would go down to Alabama and Mississippi on the buses uh, for the purpose of staging sit-ins and demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, following, of course, the uh, approach of Martin Luther King. King was very big on emphasizing peaceful protests, nonviolent resistance as sort of a witness to the truth and the justice of what they were what they were pursuing. And that was, of course, racial integration and the end of Jim Crow laws. And all that, of course, culminated in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, Stokely Carmichael experienced the worst of it, though. He was beaten by cops with clubs. He was in jail like a dozen times. And uh, really, over time, started to develop a great deal of doubt about whether or not this particular approach to civil rights uh, would work and if the goal was even worth it. I mean, all this suffering for the sake of just sitting on a bus next to white people? Really? Uh, and so the doubts really started to seep in over the course of the 1960s, and he parted ways uh, with Martin Luther King. I love this photograph of Ian King, of King uh, preaching his usual uh, message of, of uh, Christianity and, and brotherhood and the meaning of the American regime, and Carmichael just looking bored. <laughs> that seemed to be uh, the real uh, difference between them over time. And so, yeah, Carmichael reformulated the concept of black power um, and made it the key uh, the key message of his uh, political career. There he was speaking to the Students for a Democratic Society, remember them? About black power, um, got involved in uh, these major civil rights organizations that were younger and more vibrant and a lot more radical. Uh, he indeed got involved with the Black Panthers in later years and uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't a member earlier on, but became, became one of their chief advisors and held some high office among uh, the Black Panthers. And so, yeah, really wound up in the radical politics of the 1960s, really lost faith in the American regime, uh, seemed, to, seemed to conclude that America was fundamentally evil, uh, driven deeply by racism to its absolute core, that it offered nothing to black people, that the way forward was their own self-assertion. It wasn't an appeal to anything that America claimed to be about. Uh, this called for blacks to just rise above it entirely. Black power became a very important model in coming years for 
brown power for yellow power. Those were indeed the phrases used by a lot of uh, ethnic groups within the United States and racial groups who came to kind of the same conclusion that maybe we don't need to appeal to what America is. Maybe we, we need to choose our own course and our own self-determination. And so there was red power, uh, Native American uh, protesters who stormed the uh, museum at Little Bighorn and Alcatraz Island. And of course, uh, a lot of the brown power translated into the uh, um, agricultural workers uprisings in Central Valley in California. And so, yeah, you, you see in this era, this concept of race becoming more fundamental than any other aspect of U.S. citizenship or any kind of brotherhood between people. And uh, Stokely Carmichael is the guy that, that started this. What did Martin Luther King think of all this? He actually responded to it. Uh, if you read Letter from Birmingham Jail, he's very clear distancing himself with black, from black power, which in 1963 wasn't that big, but by 1966, 67, and into the 70s, it was. That's when you saw the rise of the Black Panthers, and uh, Carmichael went off on his own with a lot of his black power movements. What did King say? His book, what, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, 1967. In the final analysis, the weakness of black power is its failure to see that the black man needs the white man, and the white man needs the black man. Yeah, we may not like each other, you know, but, but we need each other. Uh, we're in this common destiny as fellow Americans, and there's no getting away from that. However much we may try to romantic, romanticize the slogan, there is no separate black path to power and fulfillment that does not intersect in some way with white paths. And there's no separate white path to power and fulfillment, short of social disaster, that does not share the same power with black aspirations for freedom and human dignity. You know, any attempt to advance ourselves as groups, we're going to meet, we're going to converge. So we are bound together in a single garment of destiny. The language, the culture, the cultural patterns, the music, I think jazz and pop music and so much of the uh, integration of black and white sounds, all of it, right? The material prosperity, even the food of America, uh, they are an al they are algam al sorry, can't say that word. Uh, of black and white, and there's no getting away from that. So King flatly rejected black power. Who knows, would he have changed his mind later? Uh, he was assassinated uh, April of the following year of 1968. That just gave even greater force to black power and the growing doubts uh, about America. Stokely Carmichael, though, as you see, goes off completely on its own. And he is, he marks a major departure, of course, from W.B. Du Bois as well. Uh, du Bois was around, he passed away in 1960. Three, I think it was, or 64, he was quite up in age and so wasn't directly involved in the civil rights movement at the time. Uh, did he know about Carmichael? Did he say anything about him? Not that I'm aware of. Um, but you can tell, though, Carmichael is very different from King. He's very different from Du Bois. This is a real radical redefinition of what it means to be Black in America or of any minority racial group at all. At the same time, notice, it isn't quite, um, it isn't quite, identity politics as we think of it today either. Identity politics uh, talks kind of the same language, but it has more to do with individual experience. Carmichael is big on data. He's big on facts and social observation. So much of identity politics has much the same complaint and comes to the, some of the same conclusions, but is more interested in personal narrative and personal experience. Um, with the exception, I would say, of Black Lives Matter. They are you know, genuinely concerned about high-profile police shootings and things like that. But um, but yeah, so Black Power kind of stands historically in the middle between what we see in the earlier civil rights movement and the current concept of, of academic identity politics. So yeah, what does Carmichael have to say? His uh, 1966 article toward Black liberation, which we uh, signed for, for this week, uh, he kind of summarizes a lot of things that you find throughout his speeches. You can pull them up on YouTube and the audio is all over the place. He's a really fiery, Harry speaker, um, sort of as a preacher's voice, um, and uh, but he is a radical through and through. And uh, so, yeah, this uh, article summarizes a lot of his key uh, teachings about black power quite well. He says, one of the most appointed illustrations of the need for black power as a positive and redemptive force in society, degenerating into a form of totalitarianism, as it seemed in 1966, Vietnam, the draft, Police brutality, civil rights movements still struggling, race riots seem to seem that way. He says is to be made made by examining the history of distortion that the concept has received in the national media of publicity. In this debate, 
which he leans sarcastically, as in everything else that affects our lives, Negroes are dependent on and at the discretion of forces and institutions within the white society which have little interest in representing us honestly. So much of what gets talked about when it comes to race in America and civil rights uh, is discussed on terms set for us by white America. Uh, we have not yet learned to describe ourselves as we are, Carmichael insists. Black power is the way to do that. That is the main gist of his teaching. He says we need to reclaim our history and our identity, that you see on that first page, from the cultural terrorism and depredation of self-justifying white guilt, right? That uh, it's not enough for guilty white liberals to believe in civil rights and fight for civil rights and support civil rights. Uh, no, it's more a matter of black people asserting who they are, of uh, reclaiming their own history and identity. Uh, without reference to what white America says about them. He says to do this, we'll sh we shall have to struggle for the right to create our own terms through which to define ourselves and our relationship to the, to the society and to have these terms recognized. This is the first necessity of a free people and the first right, certainly of any oppressor, the first right that any oppressor must suspend. So yeah, to define ourselves, to look at our own history and identity and to define ourselves for ourselves, not what is defined for us. And so, you know, the con common theme you hear in radical politics, and you see this with feminism too, uh, and we saw it with the student radical last time, what if everything we think we know about ourselves is something that the system has given to us? To the point where even when we try to describe ourselves and state who we really are, we're doing it on their terms instead of our terms. The real goal of radical politics ought to do that, to do it on our terms, to liberate ourselves in such a way that we can describe ourselves as we know ourselves instead of as society says. And the student radicals saw it that way. Um, and so uh, you see Stokely Carmichael take much the same idea and apply it to the understanding of race. So much of that distortion comes, of course, from the media. You know, it's a common complaint from practically everybody you know, that the media is bias. Um, bias against this person, bias against that group. Um, what does he have to say, though? What does the media actually get wrong about, about black power? You see on the third page, what page is it, sorry? Page uh, 641. He, always, uh, he summons all these examples and demonstrations of what he means. While the press had given wide and sensational dissemination to attacks made by figures in the civil rights movement, Foremost among which are Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, we'll talk about him in a minute, uh, Whitney Young of the Urban League, and of course the hysterical rantings about black racism from the political chameleon who calls himself vice president. By that, of course, he means Hubert Humphrey, Lyndon Johnson's vice president, uh, who was actually very supportive of civil rights. Humphrey, you might recall, was the one who announced to the Democratic National Committee that we no longer needed Southern Democrats, white meaning white Southern Democrats, that we can now be the party of civil rights because there's more, more progressive Democrats in the North uh, than there are in the South. And so this is uh, largely why Lyndon Johnson chose him to be, be vice president. He said though at one point to the media, racism is racism and we must reject calls for racism wherever they come, whether they come from the throat that is white or one that is black. Um, Humphrey had a very strange way of putting things sometimes. <laughs> he wasn't very good rhetorically. But you see his point that, oh no, we, we reject black power just as much as we reject white supremacy. They're both evil. They are equally wrong. What does Carmichael think of that? Is black power a matter of black racism? Who cares, says Carmichael. You know, it's just, it's, this isn't the kind of question we can get hung up on. We haven't had a chance to even define what it means to be black, let alone what black racism might be. So it's not my problem, is kind of his point of view. But still, the fact that the media jumps all over Humphrey's words and says, wow, you know, Humphrey's took a hard line against all these black radicals and, and all that kind of thing, uh, really shows the fact that uh, the distortion is there and the media is very unwilling to hear what black power itself has to say for itself. But that's Hubert Humphrey. What about uh, those civil rights leaders who still go along with Martin Luther King, who have these religious objections to black power, specifically because it is so a-religious and it's true. You look at Carmichael, he really had practically nothing to say about religion. He was just kind of dismissive of it. 
Uh, he was a practical atheist. Don't know if he's a theoretical atheist in a you know philosophic sense, but practically he just didn't care at all about religion. And he was really kind of hostile toward it in the way that it worked within the civil rights movement. He quotes um, someone from the National Committee of Churchmen at the bottom of page 641, uh, appearing in the New York Times. We are an informal group of Negro churchmen in America who are deeply disturbed about the crisis brought upon our country by historic distortions of important human realities and the controversy about black power. What we see shining through the variety of rhetoric is not anything new, but the same old problem of power and race, which we've faced in our beloved country since 1619, of course, when the first slaves arrived in Virginia colony. Now, the conscience of black men is corrupted because having no power to implement the demands of conscience, the concern for justice and the absence of justice becomes a chaotic self-surrender. Powerless, powerlessness breeds a race of beggars. We are faced now with a situation where powerlessness, uh, powerless conscience meets conscienceless power, threatening the very foundations of our nation. No, we must go back to the first principles of our country. So again, these are people who side with Martin Luther King. These are people take a distinctly religious approach to this question. We're all equal before the eyes of God, they insist. Quotes them at length there, and this is at the end of that long quote. They, they say, we must not apologize for the existence of this form of group power, for we have been oppressed as a group and not as individuals. We will not find our way out of that oppression until both we and America accept the need for Negro Americans, as well as Jews, Italians, Poles, and white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, all these groups who've met their own levels of oppression and must be all brought up to the same standard of American citizenship and the dignity that's entitled to them by the American founding and the Declaration of Independence. What does Carmichael think of that? Traditionally, he says, for each new ethnic group, how have they advanced themselves? Take Poles or Jews or any number of other groups. They've done it by organizing for themselves their own interest as a group, their own institutions with which to represent their communal needs within the larger society. Blacks have not done that, Carmichael says. Yeah, you can look at civil rights, but civil rights was aimed so much at an appeal to America, an appeal to Congress in particular, and the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What that meant was that black people could only look to the centers of power, which of course were dominated by a bunch of white men. No, he says, it's from the bottom up. The same way the Poles did it, the same way the Jews did it, it's by organizing our own societies and creating our own conversation. Uh, you know, not so much what we're going to do, but who we are. And once we know who we are, then we'll know what to do. It must come from inside. It cannot come from outside. We can't appeal to this broad notion of what it means to be an American or what it means to be religious and how we stand before the eyes of God. No, the race is the fundamental thing, not the country not the religion, the race. So why? Why have uh, black people had to look entirely to the national level and to high lofty laws for their protection, whereas while other ethnic groups and other racial groups organize themselves? He says, well, this has everything to do with the institutions of this society, which uh, indicates, this is on page um, 643, sorry. Uh, indicates that a major concern in the ordering and structuring of the society has been the maintaining of the Negro community and its condition of dependence and oppression. And it's like we've always been dependent. That's basically what a slave was back in the days. The fact that he was dependent on the slave owner, he could not assert himself, right? Same thing now. To look to the centers of power and government for our, for our liberation makes absolutely no sense. We have to do it ourselves. He says, this has not been on the level of individual acts of discrimination between individual whites against individual Negroes. No, it has been acts by the white community against the Negro community. This is, of course, a description of what we hear so much today as systematic racism. Uh, you know, it's not that there are racists out there. Yeah, there are. But no, they're not the problem. The problem is the imprint of racism in the long lasting institutions and practices of society and our traditions in things like even the federal government, uh, racism and white supremacy leave this lasting impression. That's what needs to be shaken up, right? Who cares about the individual racist? His problem, right? It's more the systematic level that keeps blacks in this position of dependence on the centers of power instead of letting them make that power for themselves. 
So yeah, it's kind of surprising. Black Power, in the way Carmichael understands it, you get this impression that it's just sort of revenge and anger. And there's a touch of that with him. But more than that, you find in him uh, this realization that our experience just hasn't been the same as other ethnic groups in America. You know, that we haven't had the chance to do the things that bring us freedom. He says in that same paragraph, this fact cannot be too strongly emphasized that racist assumptions of white supremacy have been so deeply ingrained into the structure of society that it infuses its entire functioning and is so much a part of the national subconscious that it is taken for granted and is frequently not even recognized. Subconscious, right? The Ku Klux Klan, that's conscious. <laughs> that's in your face. Everybody sees it. The sort of subtle, hidden forms of racism, you know, those are the things that are there and they're much stronger and much more devastating to assertions of black self-consciousness uh, than anything else. And again, he's speaking, you know, post-civil rights act and post-civil rights marches and everything. It's in so many ways, the goals had been met with the end of Jim Crow, with the granting of voting rights and actual protections. And so it's prior to all of this that uh, Carmichael and people like him look around and say, yeah, but there's still racism out there. And it's still just as oppressive in some ways, even more oppressive because it's subtle, because it's hidden. Uh, you know, the, Again, the Jim Crow signs, you know, those were not hidden. The kind that is hidden is much more devastating. So what's the, what's the goal? What is the thing that no big federal law can possibly do? He says, bottom of page 644. Without bothering to list the historic factors which contribute to this pattern, yeah, there's economic exploitation, there's political impotence, there's discrimination in employment and education. You know, those are all the surface things, right? No. One can see that to correct this pattern will require far-reaching changes in the basic power relationships that are in, that, uh, that the ingrained social patterns within the society. The question is, of course, what kind of changes are necessary and how is it possible to bring them about? You know, what, what is it that's beyond the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 65? What's the next step for civil rights? What's the thing beyond all of this? He says, in recent years, the answer to these questions, which has been given by most the most articulate groups of Negroes and their white allies, the liberals, as they call themselves, of all stripes, you know, the Hubert Humphreys of the world, right? Uh, has been in terms of something called integration. You know, what was so much of the goal of the civil rights acts and civil rights movement? It was racial integration. It started, of course, in the 1950s, Brown versus Board of Education that ordered the desegregation of public schools. Uh, and then federal district courts were put in charge of the process. And then finally, Dwight Eisenhower sent down the 101st Airborne to order desegregation of the schools. But yeah, the goal was integration. Uh, so too it was with the civil rights era, civil rights movement of the early 1960s, that we have to achieve this sort of racial equality. We have to set up a society where blacks and whites can sit next to each other on buses and in classrooms and that kind of thing. And of course, this caused the violent backlash among white Southerners who were so upset about race mixing. So they call it communism, which is strange, but still... Uh, you see the, the distinct backlash about uh, being equalized with black people. They just couldn't stand that idea. It was just drove so much of the Jim Crow South at the time. According to the advocates of integration, Carmichael says, social justice will be accomplished by, quote, integrating the Negro into the mainstream institutions of society from which he has been traditionally excluded. I think it's, quote, Lyndon Johnson there. Remember it. It is very significant that each time I have heard this formulation, it's been in terms of, quote, the Negro, the individual Negro, not in terms of the community. And so the expectation of so much of the civil rights movement and the goal of the civil rights acts was to take this community of like a shared identity of blacks and reduce them each to individual persons who could be treated fundamentally equally with a white person. That totally ignores what it is to be a race, Carmichael says. That doesn't get you anywhere in terms of the kind of uh, justice that you really need. It has to be group justice, not individual. This concept of integration, he says, has to be based on the assumption that there was nothing of value in the Negro community. And that uh, little of value could be created among Negroes. So, that, so the thing to do is to siphon off the acceptable Negroes so the, the, uh, sorry, in, into the surrounding middle class white community. And so you see it happen. 
upper middle class black people who adopt the mores and the dress and the personal style of upper middle class white people. And uh, there they've achieved it, right? There they've become equal at last. They're models of the future uh, where their race becomes completely insignificant and they become professional upper class. They fit in with bourgeois mores and stuff like that. But in doing that, Carmichael says, look at what they've lost. They've lost their racial identity. They don't connect with the vast majority of other black people who aren't living that way and really don't want to. So yeah, uh, this integration goal strips something away of what it truly means to be black in America. He says goals around which the struggle took place, such as public accommodation, open housing, job opportunity at the executive level, um, and quite simply middle-class goals articulated by a tiny group of Negroes who had middle-class asp aspirations. It's true that the student demonstrations of the South during the early 60s, out of which NSCC came, it's a national, uh, the Student National Conference on Equality, came, uh, had similar orientation. But while it is hardly a concern of a black sharecropper, dishwasher, or welfare recipient, whether a certain $15 a day motel offers accommodations to Negroes, you know, what does it mean to them, really? Uh, the overt symbol of white superiority and the imposed limitations on the Negro community had to be destroyed. Now, it's time to go back to what it means to be a race and to assert who we are on that level, not in terms of what society says about individual black people who basically act like white people. No, Carmichael doesn't want that. He wants black to be black. Or as he says, it's time to look beyond these goals, right, and uh, consider the issue of collective power. The whole civil rights movement missed this point. It understood the goal of uh, its own goal as a matter of, again, uh, making black people dependent on white society. He says in the middle of page 646, the posture of the civil rights movement was that of a dependent, the, uh, dependent, the suppliant. The theory was that without attempting to create any organized base of political strength itself, the civil rights movement could, by forming coalitions with various liberal pressure organizations in the white community, liberal reform clubs, labor unions, church groups, progressive civic groups, and at times one or the other of the major political parties influence national legislation uh, and national social patterns. But that is really just dependence. What we really need, what we really want is independence. Marx said, Karl Marx, uh, said that the working class is the first class in history that has ever wanted to abolish itself. So, if one listens to some of our moderate Negro leaders, take Martin Luther King, uh, it appears that the American Negro is the first race that ever wished to abolish itself. Right? Pursuing equality with white people would just abolish the essence and meaning of blackness, it would strip that away and just turn us into these individual selves. Do we really want that? No. The SNCC, he says, it's the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, got it, got it wrong a minute ago, uh, proposes that it is now time for the Black Freedom Movement to stop pandering to the fears and anxieties of white middle class in the attempt to earn the good and earn its goodwill and to return to the ghetto to organize the com these communities to control themselves. Who cares about civil rights? Who cares about the Civil Rights Acts? Who cares about being equal with white people? No, return to the ghetto, organize ourselves. So yeah, it kind of culminates in this very separationist, uh, really kind of a return, oddly enough, to segregation. But segregation, not because it's enforced from the outside, but because it's chosen from the inside. We don't want tokenism and patronage. You know, we don't want to be the black friend. <laughs> we want to be who we are. And so let's go back to that. Consider what the ghetto is. Consider these inner city neighborhoods that he's referring to in the 1960s. That so many of them were the result of uh, Lyndon Johnson, great society projects, uh, trying to create communities uh, under the watch of the federal government. Again, uh, creating that kind of dependency. Uh, that really is just a new form of submission to power. Consider the way that urban planning is set up. Uh, there's a map of Chicago and the way that ethnic groups are, are grouped. This is in 1990, but you know, same thing. Uh, yeah, let's, instead of uh, looking to the outside to try to understand who we are, look to the inside. He says, this is precisely what Johnson tried to do 
even before the Voting Rights Act of 1966, it was actually 65, but uh, was passed. The Democratic Party sort of prided itself in this party of civil rights. It was all about trying to uh, do everything they could to end Jim Crow laws and achieve all the, the sort of justice that America aspired to. There's uh, Lyndon Johnson signing into law and he turned around and shook Martin Luther King's hand. What were the Democrats really up to when they did this? They were intended to register Democrats, Carmichael says, not Negroes. No, they weren't interested in black people as black people at all. They were just interested in how far they could turn black people into Democrats. The president and the top officials of the Democratic Party called in almost 100 select Negro leaders from around the Deep South, and nothing was said about changing the policies of the racist state parties, and nothing was said about repudiating such leadership figures as Eastland and Ross Barnett uh, in Mississippi or George Wallace in Alabama. Eastland, by the way, was uh, the, the uh, Terry Eastland, the chair of the House Rules Committee, if I remember right, uh, who strategized to block all the civil rights legislation. But yeah, nothing was said about George Wallace. Nothing was said about all kinds of racist white leaders in the South. No, it was all symbolic. It was all about how the Democrats can feel good about themselves and above all, how that symbol can persuade black people to vote for them. They didn't want, their, they didn't want them as a group. They wanted their votes and that was it. And so it has been <laughs> ever since the Civil Rights Act. Um, you saw a steady climb uh, in the Democratic Party um, in 1952, because of Harry Truman, it was very open to civil rights, though he didn't really succeed at the time. It dipped a little bit during the Eisenhower years, and then it shot back up again with the Civil Rights Act, and black voters have stayed Democrats ever since. Carmichael says, though, what does this actually do for us? You know, just because they give us the right to sit on a bus next to a white guy, just because they give us the right to stay in a hotel or eat in a restaurant, and that means we're supposed to be totally loyal to them? And so it was. In the course of the later 1960s and into the 70s, organizations, uh, specific, uh, especially the Black Panther Party, formed in uh, Oakland, California, and then uh, developed chapters around the country, accepted this idea of uh, self-determination, of racial essence, of, again, not seeing ourselves as individuals, not desiring equality with Black people. The whole vision of the civil rights movement just kind of disappears, uh, not for everybody, of course, but certainly for these groups. Although the Black Panthers have an interesting backstory. Uh, they actually started not with Stokely Carmichael's ideas of, of you know, racial identity and that kind of thing, but uh, more a matter of individual self-defense. Notice they carry a lot of guns. Huey Newton and Bobby Steele standing in front of the uh, party headquarters. Most of what they started off doing was following uh, other black motorists who would then be pulled over by white cops and be harassed because the taillight was out and all this kind of thing. And these are the incidents that would very fre frequently escalate into the race riots you saw in Watts, in Baltimore, in Chicago, and in the, through the late 1960s. But they would pull out, they would follow the cop and get out of the car and just kind of stand there with their guns. Don't point it at the police officer, obviously, but just let them know that we will protect members of our own community. Well, California, uh, a bill came before the state assembly uh, in the late, uh, early 1970s, uh, that was the first ever conceal and carry law uh, against carrying guns. And guess who signed it into law? Conservative icon, Ronald Reagan. And so as the bill was being deliberated over, as the, as the Governor Reagan was about to sign it, a whole bunch of protesters showed up on the steps of the Capitol in Sacramento with a bunch of guns looking pretty threatening, but not meaning to threaten so much as make a point that this is our Second Amendment right. The Second Amendment. I mean, think, think about all the arguments you hear today from radical gun rights advocates who say that, you know, we need guns to resist the government. Isn't that exactly what the Panthers were doing? <laughs> Resisting abusive, tyrannical government that was harassing them on the basis of their race? But they understood their rights as individual. Uh, that's exactly what Carmichael rejected. And yet that really was kind of the, the original basis for what the Black Panthers were about in this era. So the law was signed, conceal and carry law was implemented and cops could now uh, pull over black motorists who had guns inside their cars and book them on that basis because of the state law. Uh, still though, it's a stunning twist in the story. And it really raises the question too, I mean, what are we really asking for when we talk about racial justice? Are we looking for group identity uh, in the sense that we think of it today? Or 
are we talking about the need for individuals to assert their liberty? Or think about it this way, what do we need more, equality or liberty? The way that so much of the conversation today about race and uh, you know, part of the reason I think it's so difficult for people is because we, we take equality as kind of the single principle that matters here, you know, racial equality, racial equality. Um, but you know, Carmichael pretty flatly rejected that, you know, first of all. Plus, it excludes the possibility that what we need is individual liberty. Uh, what, what do oppressed minorities truly need? To be treated special as minority groups or to be treated as individuals entitled to the very same rights as everyone else? equal before the law. At the same time, you can kind of see the value of what, you can, you can really see the value of what Carmichael is talking about when you consider the ethos of academic diversity uh, that we hear so much about today, that uh, racial identity is fundamentally equal to every other identity out there. <laughs> you're just another color in the rainbow. <laughs> you're, there's nothing distinctly unique about your heritage and your people and the suffering and the struggle. You're just one more color. You're just one more thing that's in the big mix of diversity. That doesn't entirely capture what we wanna say about race either. So we're, I think we're torn between these extremes of individual liberty on one hand, uh, group identity on another, and then uh, individual equality at the other extreme. Um, maybe the way forward in uh, conversations about race would do well to uh, compare and contrast those views. But still, let's uh, sum up. Carmichael, uh, in contrast with who you looked at earlier, W.B. Du Bois. Whatever the answer was for Du Bois, this had everything to do with education. Education in what it meant to be human, uh, which is something that Carmichael is not all that interested in. He does not see human education at all. He sees black education. He sees education attuned entirely to the needs of groups of individuals, or sorry, groups of, of people uh, with a certain racial identity, and that's about all. So uh, Du Bois looks to wisdom. Uh, he looks to philosophy, the willingness to look outside of ourselves. And even though he doesn't arrive at a religious faith, he's very skeptical about it. He read the uh, Faith of Our Fathers chapter. Uh, still, philosophically, he, he asks for something like what faith actually does uh, in our ability to see who we are, eternally speaking, and that in turn can make greater sense of who we are uh, in our racial identity or anything else. So, what do you think? Carmichael or Du Bois? Uh, who gets it right? Uh, open that up to question. I believe your uh, quiz this week will, will ask that question. So, with radical politics and race, there's radical politics and women. You guys looked at uh, Lucretia Mott a while ago, and uh, her famous discourse on woman is one of the uh, most important documents in the suffragette movement, early feminism. And uh, she makes a really compelling claim in that document that uh, women realize their equality with men precisely by looking to their femininity. You know, it's the fact that a woman is a woman and that God made women to be women. Uh, it's in accepting that to the deepest part of a woman's nature that they, they find the real basis of equality with men, not to mention their happiness. Uh, and so that's one side of the debate that was going on in the early days of the suffrage movement. There was, however, another side, and I think you might've touched on this, but just in case, uh, the other side came from Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she didn't really like the idea that womanhood was somehow natural or essential to who a person was as a woman. She saw femininity as supplementary. Uh, it was a good thing, but it didn't go to the soul of, it, you go to the heart of what a woman actually was. She had this uh, famous speech that was actually a testimony she gave before Congress in 1892, arguing for the woman's right to vote. And it was published widely, her little essay, Solitude of Self. And there she says, the isolation of every human soul and the necessity of self-dependence must give each individual the right to choose his own surroundings. Uh, she, he says, she says his, but she should say his or hers. Right? Uh, no matter how much women, uh, women prefer, to learn, uh, prefer to lean, to be protected and supported by men, right? Nor how much men desire to have them do so. They must make the voyage of life alone. For safety and emergency, they must know something of the laws of navigation, right? We can't think that womanhood and all the roles of a, that a woman falls into as wife, as mother, 
and all these other you know expectations of femininity can guide us and our purpose in life. No, we have to look at it uh, as a secondary aspect of what a person actually is. No mortal, she says, ever has been. No mortal ever will be like the soul just launched on the sea of life. And so, back to politics, back to voting rights, to deny political equality is to rob the ostracize of all self-respect of credit in the marketplace, of recompense in the world of work, of a voice among those who make it in Mr. Law, a choice in the jury before whom they are tried and the judge who decides their punishment. We are all fundamentally deep down selves, and that's it. What is a man? What is a woman? Those are secondary properties of what it means to be a self. And uh, so we can't, we should not be stuck in the roles that are assigned to us from outside. It ought to be something that we choose. The self is more fundamental than what a man or a woman is. Now, this is 1892. Do you hear glimmers of the uh, understanding of transgender politics as we think of it today? That's very much what's going on here. Stanton didn't advocate that. She probably couldn't even have conceived of that, but, but still the notion that the self is more fundamental than any kind of gendered uh, characteristic is uh, really important in the trajectory of feminism and ultimately of the transgender movement we hear today. But you notice the difference with Lucretia Mott. For Mott, a woman is a woman all the way down. Her femininity is embedded in her soul, right? It's, it's something she'll take with her into eternity. Not for Stanton. No, a woman is a woman only on the surface. And sure, it's something she chooses. It's something she probably likes. Probably likes being a wife and mom. That's fine. But it's her choice. It's not something that isn't forced on her. The solitude of the self is the truest route to freedom. And so this is the central debate that we hear going on within uh, feminism, especially over the right to vote. You know, is, is a woman equal to a man because she's exactly like a man? Or is a woman equal to man because she's more of a woman, right? Separate, but equal, you might say, um, in terms of uh, what a woman is. You think about some of the anti-suffragette posters of this era. They're quite funny. You know, there's the voting woman off to vote, leaving her pathetic husband home with children. He can't possibly do it himself. What a joke, right? Screaming babies and he's holding the bottle and you know, the women crying, the disheveled husband has no idea what to do with his home. The suffragette Madonna is quite hilarious. It's obviously aimed at uh, Irish or Italian Catholic immigrants. Uh, how, you know, it's almost like a sacrilege, but hey, isn't that what suffrage, uh, women's voting itself is? The thought was, too, that, you know, if women gain the right to vote, it will damage not just the home, but relationships with men, sexual relationships, relationships between husbands and wives. No, how do you how do you get votes? What's the suffragette vote getting? Do it the easy way. Have your husband vote on your behalf and remain a happy marriage. Some of these went pretty far as to suggest that if women gain the right to vote, they'll start, you know, having love relationships with each other. Of course, uh, lesbianism back in this era was kind of a laughable thing for most people. Uh, being a gay man, of course, could get you landed in jail. But um, for, for women, though, it was just sort of this joke. Girls are doing all the fellows' jobs now. If they start voting, next thing they'll be falling in love with each other. Ah, that's ridiculous. How could we stand for that? So there you have kind of the, uh, the criticism of uh, women's claim to the right to vote. But there was the Lucretia Mott advocacy for women's right to vote, too which wasn't derived from radical individualism of women. It was derived from their femininity. Women have babies, after all. That's why they ought to have the right to vote. Women stay home and take care of their children. That's why they have, ought to have the right to vote. They vote because they understand the needs of women as women. Their femininity does not go away. And so between uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, for a time, for a large chunk of the earlier 20th century, Mott actually prevailed. Women accepted their femininity for what it was. Uh, the 1920s, it might have fallen into doubt. So you think of the, the liberated flapper, and she's you know increasingly androgynous. But certainly by the mid 20th century, yeah, femininity came back as something fundamental to what a woman was. Her desire for a home and children was not just something that society pushed on her. It's something that she really did want deep, deep down. And so we enter post-war America. What's it like? The soldiers come home at the end of World War II, and they're ready to settle down. 
They want stability and calm. They've probably been shot at. They've probably seen friends die over there. No, nah, it's uh, they're ready for all the luxuries and ease of uh, calm domestic American life. They want to marry their sweethearts and start a home and start a family, according to Whitman's chocolates. <laughs> so by the ads of this era, this, of course, leads to the baby boom and uh, the huge burst in the American population at the time, which is still uh, you know, having a great impact on American society today. It's remarkable to think we've had three presidents all born in the year 1946, the year after World War II ended. Donald Trump, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton, all that same year. Uh, so, yeah, we're seeing, the, I think, kind of the, the, the final gasp of the baby boom generation in our current time. What happens, though, as the 1940s and 1950s roll on, the prosperity, the uh, uh, desire to settle down, the desire that seems to be in women to have babies, to have a home, uh, to have a husband, and all these things that uh, they were supposed to just, uh, all these things that they're expected to want naturally. Well, a book comes out in uh, the end of the 1950s, or uh, published in 1963, I should say. The study was done through the late 1950s by Betty Friedan. Who was Betty Friedan? She did the mommy thing. She was one of those housewives. She accepted for much of her young younger life that this was the way forward uh, and didn't really question it until her kids got a little bit older. She got in touch with a lot of uh, her friends from college and uh, started asking them about what they thought of their lives now that they were married and had kids and everything like her. What's, what's this all about? What does it mean to be a woman in this day and age? And she came to some pretty shocking conclusions. Something had gone wrong. Women achieved so much when it came to the right to vote, but they thought that was the end of the line. And then they went right back to accepting their femininity. So really, for Dan, is kind of uh, she resurrects a lot of the ideas of Elizabeth, of, Elizabeth, of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That perhaps a lot of what it means to be a woman, a lot of our perceptions of femininity are something that we really have kind of made up for ourselves. Or really, as for Dan proposes, it's something that's been forced on us. It's a mystique, right? It's something you are tricked into wanting. When in fact, if you listen to yourself and really think about it, you don't actually want it. You just think you do because society has forced it on you. The problem, she says on page 106 of your packet, the problem lay buried, unspoken, for many years in the minds of American women. It's a strange stirring, she says, a sense of dissatisfaction, a yearning that women suffer in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Each suburban wife struggled with it alone. She made beds and she shopped for groceries and matched slipcover material and made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for her children and chauffeured Cub Scouts and brownies and lie next to her husband at night as he snored, probably. <laughs> she was afraid to ask even of herself the silent question, is this all? I mean, I, I'm told that I'm living in utopia here. I've got the right to vote. I've got a house and a husband and children. And everybody's told me that this is the sum of all my desires. And yet the haunting question within me asks again and again, is this all? For over 15 years, there was no word in this yearning and the millions of words written about women, for women, and all the columns and books and articles by experts telling women their role is to seek fulfillment as wives and mothers. That's what they're told. That's what they believed. Over and over again, they heard in voices of tradition or of Freudian sophistication that they would desire no greater destiny than the glory of their own femininity. Of course, Ferdinand looks to all of the recent publications and books and articles and everything like that. She didn't look to Lucretia Mott, right? Mott thought about this very, very carefully, that yes, the glory of femininity is real and it's desirable and women ought to want it because it's good and wonderful. Ferdinand says, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think it's a mystique. I think it's something that we are made to think is wonderful. Is it really? Well, let's consider those women who have fully embraced it today. Do they think it's wonderful? She points out by the end of the 1950s, the average marriage age of women in America dropped to 20 from what it had been in the previous decades. 
and was still dropping into the teens. 14 million girls were engaged by 17 years old. The proportion of women attending college in comparison with men dropped from 47% in 1920, a very liberated age, right? To 35% in 1958. And even those who did go to college in the 1950s didn't go to learn much. They went to find a husband. They studied home economics. <laughs> They were focused on a degree that would just be kind of interesting for them, but they wouldn't really use it in a career. A lot of them ended up as uh, pursuing the, the PhD degree, which stands for putting husband through. <laughs> What's going on here, says Ferdinand. How has the understanding of women and their education and their careers changed so much since the 1920s? Well, obviously it was a depression, it was World War II, but what about those things changed at all? How should we understand it today? We look around and we find interior decorators who design kitchens and homes and, and everything to appeal to what women want, or at least what those interior decorators think that women ought to want. The greatest source of this came from a very popular magazine, McCall's Magazine. You don't see it in this chapter, but uh, later chapters in Feminine Mystique, she really takes a hard look at McCall's and the way that it's designed and the things that it seems to say women ought to want, the things that women ought to do. You know, they want to knit gloves for their husbands while they take naps. <laughs> they, want, they want to wax their kitchen floors. They want to look at new interior design. She talks about, uh, you know, the, the appeal of the kitchen as like the woman's domain where men would just never even go, uh, even to wash dishes. For the record, I spend just about as much time in the kitchen as Rochelle does. Just want everybody to know that. But um, uh, home sewing becomes this really popular thing. And this is what really gets for Dan later in the book, because she says, look at who's designing all these fashions and styles for women. It's not other women. It's men. Look at the whole editorial board of McCall's magazine. There's no women on it. It's men. Men are basically writing about what women ought to want, and they're designing what women ought to wear. What's going on here? This looks like quite a conspiracy, she says. Nicole's magazine is creating an ideal, creating a feminine mystique that is really instrumental in, in not just oppressing women, but tricking them into not even seeing their oppression, tricking them into thinking that their highest desire is pretty dresses, a nice house in a suburb, a husband and babies. She says on page 107, the suburban housewife, she was the dream image of, young, of the young American woman and the envy, it was said, of women all over the world. The American housewife, freed by science and labor-saving appliances, from drudgery, from the dangers of childbirth and the illnesses of her grandmother. Who wouldn't want this? Haven't we arrived at everything we ever wanted, says society, carefully orchestrated by men? She was healthy, beautiful, educated, concerned only about her husband and her children and her home. She found true feminine fulfillment. As a housewife and mother, she was respected as a full and equal partner, partner to the man in the world, and she was free to choose automobiles and clothes, appliances and supermarkets. She has everything a woman would ever dream of. In the 15 years after World War II, the mystique of feminine fulfillment became the cherished and self-perpetuating core of American culture. So the housewife is this pure social construction. And it's this trick, this, this really diabolical trick, because it makes women think that this is what they want to be, this is who they really are, and it sets it up as the ideal to be chased after. And they're tricked into ever asking, is this all? Right? Their only dream page 108 toward the top, was to be perfect wives and mothers. Their highest ambition was to have five children, a beautiful house. Their only fight was to keep their husbands away from other women, I guess. And that no, and that, uh, no thought for the unfeminine problems of the world outside the home. They wanted men to make the major decisions. They gloried in their role as women. They were proud uh, on the census, to uh, the census blank, to check what? Occupation? Housewife. And that was it. And yet they find themselves asking, what's wrong with me? Why am I so unhappy with myself? Something doesn't seem right. And I can't say what it is. It's a problem that 
has no name. And it pops up in my mind as I'm waxing my kitchen floor, she says. She's so ashamed to admit her dissatisfaction that she never knew how many other women shared it. You're not supposed to be dissatisfied. You're supposed to be happy waxing the floor or taking care of your husband and your children. She tried to tell her husband he had no idea what she was talking about. And sometimes he'd get a little mad because she seemed ungrateful. Look at the house you're living in. Look at all the money I bring home. Shouldn't you just be happy, he says. Nobody understands, and she feels alone with the problem that has no name. It's kind of a stuffy, claustrophobic, lonely problem that she faces. Just what was the problem that has no name, she asks, again on page 108 in the middle. What were the words women use when they try to express it? Sometimes a woman would say, I feel empty somehow, incomplete, again referring to all the interviews she did with friends of hers from college. Sometimes she blotted out the feeling with a tranquilizer. <laughs> Indeed, the uh, drugs in this era <laughs> became pretty popular. Sometimes she thought the problem was with her husband, her children. She tried to blame somebody else, right? Maybe it's her neighborhood. Maybe she should have an affair. Maybe she'd have another baby. Sometimes she went to a doctor with symptoms she couldn't describe. I feel tired, she says. I feel like crying with no reason. A Cleveland doctor referred to this as the housewife syndrome. The housewife's blight. Eh, something weird that goes on in the minds of these housewives, and maybe there's a cure for it. Maybe we'll find it. Maybe it's in drugs. Maybe it's in exercise. Maybe it's in who knows. Maybe just another baby. Maybe, you know, whatever. I've tried everything women are supposed to do, says another woman. Again, her interviews. Gardening, pickling, <laughs> canning, being very social with my neighbors, joining committees, running PTATs. I can do it all, and I like it, but it doesn't leave anything you think about, anything you are. What am I? Who am I? These women say, lost and bewildered. What am I looking forward to? Time Magazine had its cover story, The American Housewife, and The Suburban Housewife, An American Phenomenon. Who is she? What is she? And indeed, Time Magazine found out, despite all that she has, she's unhappy. Something's just not right. Uh, CBS Television had the Trapped Housewife news special. You know, are women trapped in their homes? Are they sort of shut out from the things that they really want. Well, what do they really want? They can't seem to say, well, maybe they should just chill out and be happy. Women go off to college to study. Uh, and one of the most popular majors, and this is true for much of the early 20th century, was home economics. <laughs> Learning how to iron, hand iron handkerchiefs. Learning how to cook. And that kind of thing. The home economics major was immensely popular because the assumption was, well, you're just here to find a husband anyway, so you might as well learn how to be a homemaker. Others try to address the problem by giving lots and lots of advice about sex. <laughs> what, what are we not understanding about fulfillment? Maybe the doctor can lay it out for us. Um, some have joked, well, maybe we need to take away their right to vote. And then maybe they'll be happy again. Maybe voting has made them unhappy. Others have blamed women themselves. It's your fault that you're unhappy. It's your fault that you feel unsatisfied. But for Dan says, no. It's none of those things. It's the feminine mystique. It's the whole burden of being a woman piled onto women by a society very carefully and engineered by men. Not because men are malicious and hateful, maybe some are, but they're just kind of part of the problem themselves. And chances are they miss out on the fullness of what, the full happiness of what women might feel and what kind of relationships they might enjoy. And so I propose, she says, in The Feminine Mystique, a fuller explanation of what this actually is. Others have gone a very interesting direction, though, she points out in page 110, and tried to recover what Lucretia Mott said, what some of the earlier feminists said about femininity being so integral to what a woman is that they should fully embrace it. She says on page 110, it is no longer possible today to blame the problem on loss of femininity. To say that education and independence and equality with men have made American women unfeminine? No. He says, I've heard so many women try to deny this dissatisfied voice within themselves because it does not fit with the pretty picture of femininity that, ex that experts have given them. I think, in fact, that this is the first clue to the mystery. The problem cannot be understood in the generally accepted terms by which scientists have studied women. Doctors, doctors have treated them, counselors have advised them, and writers have written about them. No. Women who suffer this problem, in whom their voice is stirring, have lived their whole lives in the pursuit of this feminine fulfillment. 
They know what femininity is. They've embraced it. Now the dissatisfaction comes in realizing that maybe it's not something they choose for themselves. Maybe they ought to learn to choose it for themselves instead of have it imposed on them from the outside. Maybe consider new possibilities about what it actually means to be a woman. And so she goes on uh, in The Feminine Mystique. There's a big book, uh, many things about 300 pages long, looking at every single aspect of, of femininity, uh, very carefully scouring the pages of McCall's magazine and looking at the way that so much of what we think we desire as women is something that's actually given to us. What was the popular reaction to this? Here's some letters to the editor of McCall's. Women who value their roles as mothers and housewives interpreted Ferdinand's message as one that threatened their stability, devalue their labor, hard taking care of little kids, right? And disrespecting their intelligence. Another writer said, all this time I thought I was happy and a nice person. Now I discover in this crazy book that I've been miserable, some sort of monster in disguise, now out of disguise. How awful. Totally dismissed it. Another said, if mothers or housewives, as we are, as we are called in this book, took this advice, what would become of our children? Or better yet, the future of the world. So some pushback from, uh, from Friedan, some skepticism about the feminine mystique. A lot of women willing to say that their femininity really does, really does go to the core of who they are, agreeing basically with Lucretia Mott. Still, Friedan was immensely successful in starting so much of what is frequently called second wave feminism. She was instrumental in founding the National Organization for Women, the NOW uh, organization, that advocated for a really broad kind of equality, equality with men. Uh, and it was very clear to, uh, to her and to uh, a lot of others that this meant calling into question everything we thought was naturally feminine. Of course, the more conservative feminists looked at this and said, well, no, what's naturally feminine is precisely how we are equal with men. It's the glory of femininity. It's a good thing. Uh, the way Lucretia Mott understood it. But ultimately, through the course of the 1960s, it truly was for Dan's understanding that prevailed. So even as a new generation of women come up in the 70s and the 90s, and then today, millennials, uh, even as they sort of rediscover these very deep desires that they might have for a home and a husband and things like that, it's still sort of overshadowed by the possibility that it's all fundamentally a social construction. Maybe everything we mean by a woman is socially constructed. And you strip all the layers away of tradition and expectation and all that and way down deep, maybe there's nothing or maybe there's something that's naturally feminine. But if there is, well, doesn't that kind of point us right back to Lucretia Mott? So what do you think? I think this will, uh, something like this will be the quiz question. What's the real difference between Ferdinand and Mott? Uh, is there such thing as a feminine soul that goes all the way down to who a woman is at the deepest level? Is there something eternal about her femininity, you know, that'll stay with her forever and ever for all eternity? Is there something fixed and permanent about it? Or is it something that is really just kind of made up by society? And if you strip it away, you find what Elizabeth Cady Stanton called the solitude of the self. And in that is true freedom and true equality. And true, if the self turns right around and chooses to be a woman again, great. Uh, but if not, you know, that's the self decision. What is masculinity and femininity anyway? So uh, I really enjoyed doing this. I, I love going over these readings and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Have a wonderful weekend and uh, talk to you soon.